I will start sharing. Yeah? Yes, please do that. Uh, so, so Yuval Benjamini uh, is uh, uh, not the Benjamini of the <laughs> discovery rate. Sorry, Yuval, for introducing you uh, like this. Um, uh, but he's also working on uh, uh, high throughput uh, genomic data and uh, on um, especially uh, on, uh, on on uh, selective inference. Uh, so Yuval is a assistant professor at uh, at uh, in Jerusalem at the Hebrew University, uh, and I know him since uh, a few years because uh, we we met when. Uh, like, uh, yeah, a bit more than 10 years ago when I was uh, doing a postdoc in, in Berkeley and he was a grad student at that time. So I'm really happy to, uh, to, having, uh, to have him uh, this afternoon. Yuval. It's, uh, Thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Is this okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Pierre, for organizing the symposium and for inviting me and inviting all the, the rest of the great speakers that I'm looking forward to here. Uh, and uh, it is it is a shame that uh, I cannot come to Paris and give the talk and then meet everybody, but uh, of course feel free to uh, replace this with the meager, uh, you know, you can always email and, and so on. So I would love to hear from uh, uh, comments from the audience, even if you uh, are far away now from a microphone and so on. Uh, Today, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, pin down inference, but really it's uh, how to do inference for region detection in uh, genomic signals. Uh, and uh, it's based on uh, what I'll talk today is based on work with Jonathan Taylor and Raffaele Rizari, but uh, offshoots from these are uh, with uh, Keegan uh, Kortauer and Amit Meir. I think Keegan and Amit are not in the respective, uh, I will update it by the end of the talk. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, so uh, the model problem I'm thinking about is, uh, and, and that started me working on this, is detecting uh, differentially methylated regions or DMRs. Uh, I hope the audience may be more familiar than me with differentially methylated regions, but I'll briefly remind you that uh, DNA methylation is uh, a type of genomic information that uh, a type of, 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 of information that is external to the DNA sequence itself uh, and uh, can vary between different tissues. Also, maybe can vary somewhat uh, along the life the, the, the lifetime of, of a person or re partially respond to events uh, that happen uh, during uh, uh, the life of the organism. And uh, uh, it uh, affects the, the productivity of the genes. Uh, and the, the main thing that is important for us is that different tissues have different methylation patterns. And we, we are interested in identifying areas where methylation uh, the, uh, is different. So in fact, uh, we see methylation at various points along the genome, where, wherever there's uh, CPG uh, sites. Uh, but usually the, the, uh, we expect these patterns to be longer than individual sites. So we look for multiple sites where there's a difference. And here I show you uh, many samples from two types of tissues, the blue tissues and the red. Uh, one is colon and one is oral. I, and uh, you can see that here we have three consecutive, pro this is 100 probes uh, the, the, for this technology. There's about uh, 450,000 uh, probes along the, the full uh, human chromosome, uh, human genome. And so we have here three consecutive probes where the red is uh, less methylated than the blue. And so we might want to find this area and also ask how big is the effect? How big do we expect this effect to hold if we have new individuals, uh, new types of uh, tissue from oral and colon? So, Right. Okay, so basically the goal is to identify regions of large population level differences in the methylation process, which is non-stationary. So let's go through these one after the other. First of all, population level differences. So we observe samples from two types of whatever tissue or maybe uh, cancer versus normal tissue. Uh, and we are looking not for differences in these samples, but things that will generalize. Furthermore, we're looking for regions. Why are we interested in regions? Uh, first of all, we, we think that the, the process, the effect of methylation is not per individual site. 
And also we hope that if we look for regions, we have better power to detect. Uh, we want to identify them, meaning that these are not regions that are known in advance. We look for large effects because it's well documented that if you have tiny, even if the effects are significant, but they're tiny, they might not have any biological meaning. They might be just imbalances in the, uh, maybe in the group, uh, in, in the, the specific samples that we have. And finally, non-stationarity, I don't know if you can see, but the probes are not evenly spaced along the genome. And sometimes they're highly correlated. Sometimes there are jumps in the correlation. So what this means is it's not very easy to compare a region from one area in the genome to a region from another area in the genome. So we would look for local methods. And in terms of what I want to do statistically today, I want to identify re the regions and es estimate the difference, the population difference within this region with confidence or with putting a confidence interval. Maybe I want to put a p-value saying what's the, uh, you know, uh, uh, about the, for, for a test where the, the two uh, samples are identical. And I need to account for the fact that I'm selecting the region, that there are different region sizes and different local covariances, okay? So there are many ways to identify differential regions, many, many, many algorithms. And I am going to look at perhaps one of the simplest, but a very popular one. I call this threshold emerge. What we do is we process each data sample, smooth them, remove the noise and so on and so forth. But then at each individual probe, we estimate a statistic saying how big the difference is. For instance, here, do, do you see my, my, my mouse? Yeah, okay. So for instance, here, we look at all the, all the statistics at this point, and we uh, estimate the, the average difference. This is a statistic. And then we select the threshold, and only the points that pass the threshold are retained. And then we merge them into clusters. So we have, or into regions. So we have one region here and a second region of size three here. And then each region is summarized individually, maybe by how long it is, or how high the highest peak or something like that. And so we get a statistic and a list of regions and statistics and we do a multiplicity correction, okay? So this is the program. And uh, in fact, this is a program, uh, I'm going to give you two examples. One is Bump Hunter by Yaffe et al. And this is what got me into this project because they, they, they uh, what they do here, they drop the, the ugly lines that I had before. But again, you see each probe, there, there are red dots and blue dots and there's, a smooth red curve for the red samples and a smooth blue curve for the blue samples. And I hope you can see that this black curve is simply the a subtraction of the two. So what we have is the different differential process along the genome. And then if the differential process passes some threshold, then this is defined as a differentially methylated region, the DMR, there, there are no probes here. So this is the DMR. And then they use a permutation test to give it a p-value. Okay, and then they do it across the genome. But actually, not only in genomics we see these type of methods, and as Pierre uh, hinted, this is in fMRI. So uh, in fMRI, this is a very, very almost every fMRI analysis does something of this sort. fMRI, we, we measure stuff from the brain, and so we have three-dimensional picture of the brain with a lot of points, each point is called a, a voxel. It's not really important. But what is important is that we have a linear model for each voxel. And so you get a map, a three-dimensional map of maybe like a, a cube of the brain. And for each point, you get uh, estimate, uh, a statistic, maybe saying the difference in mean activity between one condition and another. And so what you see here in the top is three slices of this map. And everywhere where you see a red or orange dot, it means that this was significant, or that, I'm sorry, that the that, uh, Z statistic passed the 2.3 threshold. So it means that it's you know, significant in a stringent uh, uh, threshold for individual points. So you see a lot of red and orange points and a lot of gray where nothing happens. But because this map has a lot of noise and the brain is very big, if you just do multiple comparison, uh, multiple co correction on this, you will get very little phenomena, very hard to tell apart important and unimportant things. Then what they do later is they group together all the neighboring three-dimensional 
voxels into what they call clusters. So this is one cluster, we have another cluster here, another cluster here, and these are three dimensional clusters, regions. And then using either uh, parametric theory or, or permutation stuff, they again give a p-value and remove all the clusters, giving a 5% uh, false uh, uh, FWE family-wise error rate, meaning that uh, the probability that any one of these clusters is by a mistake is smaller than 5%. But now you, uh, what, what is the problem with these methods? So this is just a summary of what I said before. What is the problem with these methods? Well, first of all, all they can do is test against a global null. They cannot tell you if uh, the, 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 there is no way to talk about the cluster size or the cluster significance as an effect size, as something coming from a non-null effect, right? What is a p-value? It only measures how likely this is under a null. But you know that in biology and in psychology, we have a lot of effects that are real, but are just very small and not so interesting. So all the analyses I showed you do not result in either a region effect size estimate or a confidence interval. The second problem is that the, the permutation methods and the parametric methods are both based on stationarity assumptions, meaning that everything in the brain is the same or everything along the genome is the same. And this is often not true. Okay, so what does my method do? And this is the part where we do a commercial. Later we dive into a little of the details, but for now, a commercial. What we can do is uh, what I call pin down the inference, pin down because we pin down the, the, the process at two specific points and then only look at this window, is we're using the bump, bump hunter result. So we're only looking at places that pass the threshold. So this is a region where all the probes here after smoothing maybe or not, uh, pass the specific threshold. This is the threshold. And this is the, again, I estimated the average difference. You see this is red minus blue. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this region and say, what is the average difference between the blue and the red? This is going to be my parameter. And for this parameter, I'm, I can give an estimate, I can give a confidence interval, and I can give a, a p-value. And all of these, I can then push into a multiple comparisons that only uses the number of regions that we detected. So we can maybe say, let's only take regions where the lower bound is larger than 0.3. I mean, methylation is between zero and one, right? So maybe a 30, 35% difference is, is big. So we'll only take things that where the lower bound is 0.3 or 0.35. And for these, we'll do multiple comparisons and we get effect size estimates for this, okay? So this is only one region. Of course, you, th you remember that the chromosome is huge. We have a lot of these regions. And for each one, we can put a confidence interval and then we can only retain these intervals that are interesting to us. Okay. Uh, and so why is this hard? I mean, why, why is it a problem at all? What I, I'll try to show you in the next slides is that, well, there are a few things that are difficult in this problem. First of all, our choice of what parameter to put a confidence interval already depends on the data and as you'll see, what this means is that the distribution of the observations or the distribution of a statistic, maybe the average difference between the blue and red in this observed area, it will depend on a lot of things. The threshold, which is kind of obvious, but not only that, but also the shape of the difference between the blue and the red and the co local covariance and many different things. And uh, uh, finally, to do the multiplicity correction, we'll need to, uh, the, the usual methods, try to ask how many tests did we do? But really this is a very strange question to ask in our setting because it's obvious that if I do, I, I detect a region on this parameter, so the average between here and here, then I don't have a region half the size because I only detected this one. So it's not quite clear how to count and that's not the way that we want to do it. So, okay, there's a lot of notation on this slide. I'm not sure all of it is important, but the, the important parts are these. We have the process of interest. This is the theta, one to theta d. This is or the, the theta is along the chromosome. And it's easy to think about theta just being the mean of the first uh, group and the, minus the mean of the second group. 
is a population. So this is if I have infinite colon samples and infinite oral samples. And the Z process is the same thing, but it's the difference of the averages. So the observed averages, Y bar and one and Y bar two. And what, uh, and the A uh, colon B is just saying that this is a region starting from point A to point B. So Z with this A colon B is the Zs in this region and theta is the parameters in this region. And I'm going to assume a few things that the Z is unbiased. It's like a linear model and that we have enough samples to estimate the covariance locally. It's not that important, but it, it is somewhat important. And that there we have local normality, which is not that, 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 that the average of the processes is approximately normal. It's not so bad for averages and it's not so bad for methylation data, but if you try to do it on maybe a, a single cell, maybe it's a, a, a starts to become a problematic approximation. But here is what is important. So how do we get a parameter and a statistic for the region? Well, I'm going to keep it sim simple. The parameter that I want to do a confidence interval is go just going to be the average difference in the region. So the average for A to B. And the statistic is just going to be the observed average in the region. Okay, so again, we have these red dots, which were the Z, the, the observed differences that we saw. And imagine, we always imagine that there is an underlying true mean. This is this data. And now remember that we only look at the thresholded regions, one here and one here. And so for, for, for this region, our parameter will be the average of these blue points. This is the blue dotted line. And in, in the, uh, the, the statistic is the average of the red points, the red dotted line. And so you see already the problem maybe, we want to put a confidence interval on what would happen if we have new samples, right? This is on this parameter, but in this case, the average Z we know has to be higher than this because we only selected the region where every dot was higher than the threshold, okay? So we're looking at these points, we know that we use this threshold and we try to put a confidence interval on this average, okay? Now, one more point to think about is that what's nice about this definition of a statistic and, and a parameter is that this statistic and this parameter are true however we selected the model. So this is a real para, even if we decided not to select. So suppose this point was a little bit be below the threshold, right? Then we would not select this region. We would select this smaller region, but then we would define a different parameter. Uh, the, our parameter would be theta A and A plus one, and our statistic would be Z bar A to A plus one. And this statistic and, 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 uh, and parameter, they live even though the, it's just that sometimes they are selected and sometimes they're not selected, that's all. And maybe this is the, uh, now I come to maybe the most important slide in the talk. And this is what is the effect of selection. Okay, so let's suppose I'm at first looking at samples uh, under the null. So there's no difference between the two groups. We have a simple process, Z1 to five with some correlation. And uh, we sample normally with some correlation with zero mean. And so in light blue, you see my, I, I resample a lot of these. You see the, sometimes the line goes up and sometimes it goes down. And here I calculate the statistic. I remind you that the statistic, so our region is two to four, okay? So the statistic is the average of these three points. So, and so you see that the distribution has a mean zero and is uh, nicely, uh, it's normal distributed, very easy to make inference on. But in dark blue is what happens when I only, when I selected the region. So all three points of these have to be above the threshold. And actually these two points have to be below the threshold. In this case, I get a very different distribution. It's good, it has a, it has a high tail and it drops sharply at the threshold because of course I cannot get averages lower than the threshold. So this is now a, a pretty strange distribution. I get the bias, I, it's good, but not only that, I now resampled, I didn't show you the new samples in green with an even higher correlation. And you see what happens with higher correlation? We get a different shape of a distribution. So now each different null has a different distribution that I have to work with. So this is basically the bias or what is called double dipping. If I only restrict 
and then estimate and try to put a confidence interval, I will just be completely wrong. I will always have biases and I will not use, be using the right distribution. So restating our goals, we want to make a test, we want to form a confidence interval, and all of these should hold only on given the fact that I selected A and B, and maybe the sign if it's above or below zero, based on the data. Okay, so I will just give you a few principles. We will not go into all of the details, but I will say the following. What we want our method to hold is that if we only conduct the test whenever the event occurs, whenever we have a selection, we want, uh, so we say that it controls selective type one error if we still only on the cases where we selected our probability of making an error is smaller than say 5%. And the frequentist view of this is if I drop all the other cases and only look whenever I selected, like I did with the blue stuff, right? Only whenever my process passed the threshold, I look there, I still want my test to hold well. So let's think how I can do, so, so what does it mean? Our selection event is basically saying all the points within the region should be above the threshold and the two sides of the region should be below the threshold. This is my selection set. And we have a name for these distributions. These are truncated multinormal distributions. They have a name, they have this ugly density function, which we don't know what to do with so much, but we know really well how to sample from them. There are a lot of nice algorithms that can sample well from a normal distribution under these conditional constraints. And so let me, uh, 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 and one final point before we, we, uh, I talk about p-values is that the fact that I condition actually helps me to break up the problem. So now I don't need to worry that one region falls on another region. I'm only looking at the cases where this uh, region was selected. And in fact, and this you can show statistically that then it doesn't matter whatever happens outside of my region. All the rest of the regions don't matter for the dis local distribution. So all the samples can be now very small. I can, if I have a range of a region of size three, I can only sample the five points surrounding it and so on. Okay, so the final point of the method that I'll talk about is the p-value. How do we get a p-value then? Well, actually it's all in this same plot. If I, can, if I know how to sample these blue lines, assuming that the mean was exactly zero, then I can get what the expected distribution under the mean zero uh, uh, condition is going to be. And it's simply this distribution. And so if I take a 5% percentile of this distribution and see what is, then, uh, then uh, I get a, a test because the probability under the null or worse that I will get an average greater than the quantile is smaller than 5%. So I have a new conditional p-value that I can work with. Uh, sorry, a conditional test that I can work with. And if you just take the average and ask what is the quantile for that average, then you get a conditional p-value. And now it's true that it might be hard to sample a lot of this for large regions, but uh, actually, if you're interested, we have nice, theory and algorithms for getting this sampling done much better. You only need one sample and then you can generate the p-value and so on. I will not talk about how to do a confidence interval, but basically what we do is we try a lot of different means and see what sticks. There is a, a, a inverse relation between p-values and confidence intervals. If you can do a p-value for a lot of different means, then you can get uh, by looking at only the tests that were not rejected, you get the confidence interval. So basically this is a, a map of a lot of different means that I try to sample from, and only the ones that are not rejected give me a confidence interval for the range of the average. There's of course more details hanging underneath when this is valid and so on, but this is only in the paper. And if you're interested, you can see. Uh, once we have these intervals, we can use the FCR algorithm, which is basically an inflation algorithm for confidence intervals that is similar to FDR to get confidence intervals that are uh, good for multiple tests. Okay, so in simulations, what I can say is, first of all, it works. It doesn't need really large intervals to actually get good power. 
uh, these are coverage rates. There are some problems in estimating the covariance, but we have uh, methods to overcome it. Uh, I guess maybe the, the main, the, the important uh, results are, are these. We took the real data. We compared first the, the two tissues and uh, the, the bump hunter found 6, 60,000 regions across the chromosome. And after they did their permutation method, they only reduced it to 46. Whereas under our algorithms, we found 36,000 real differences or 51,000 real differences under BH or Bonferroni. Now, this seems too much, right? Who wants 51,000 differences? But once you have a confidence interval, you can filter based on size. You can filter based on lower bound and only get the, the intervals that are small enough. And, uh, and then you're good to go. So you, you have the effects that are both significant and large. On the other hand, when I only took one of the samples and split it randomly, then you see that we did not, uh, the, the, the permutation method, original method works well, but our method works well as well, and we don't get uh, 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 any uh, splits. And this is an example of what the results look like. So this is a region that was found, about six or eight probes, I think. And you see that we get extremely tight confidence intervals separated away from zero. And again, on the top side, of course, as you go down the list, you get intervals that are closer and closer to zero and we can start rejecting them and so on. Uh, I guess I'll stop here. Uh, just remind you that you should not use the same data for the, uh, that if you use the same data for detecting and evaluating, you need to work more and most of the methods currently only give you p-values against the strong null, but our work we looked into how to give, by, by using conditional inference, uh, we can, uh, no assumption of stationarity, give you uh, confidence intervals and models that work even under non-null. So uh, I guess that's it. Uh, if you want, uh, uh, we have, uh, as I said, with uh, Keegan, we have permutation-based methods that also works on single cell and with much smaller samples. Uh, uh, so you can also check that out. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Yuval, for this uh, very nice talk. We have a uh, few minutes for, for questions. Uh, so, so, and we have uh, a few questions in the in the Q and A. Uh, so we we'll start with a question of Natalie uh, from uh, the the Toulouse uh, Inrae uh, team. Uh, if I understood correctly, you rely on a threshold to have candidate regions in your applications. You never have cases where relevant thresholds lead to either isolated locations or too large regions. Are you always able to find a relevant threshold? Well, that, that's a good question, and I, I don't have a good answer for this. I mean, you can you can use a threshold based on the on the Z statistics also. I mean, so you, maybe some kind of uh, probability based. You can uh, select a threshold based on other chromosomes and then use the threshold in this chromosome, and I think you're okay. Uh, but it's true that I have, and and really in some sense. The dependence on the threshold on every any individual region is very, very small. So I don't think the impact is big, but I don't have theoretical basis for selecting the threshold adaptively. Uh, I probably need to show that it doesn't matter much, but uh, I currently don't have that. And, uh, uh, and so this is uh, really a thing that we should uh, take care of uh, theoretically. In practice, I don't think it matters a lot. I mean, if you select based on many other, many of the regions, then the effect of this selection on any individual threshold then we, on any individual region is, is small. Uh, you should definitely not select the threshold based on just the, the four or five regions on the top because that would, at least for my method, work uh, poorly. Uh, okay. So next question is- Alexandre uh, Vettier. Is your method applicable for array-based methylation measurements or other restricted methylation arrays? So again, I, I, for now, I assume normality. So you need to have either in, enough uh, examples to work with or uh, a, and so I, I, either enough examples or, or a, a, a well-behaved signal like the, the, the array-based uh, uh, results. 
I mean, I tried the beta, like working on the beta transform. That's fine. It doesn't matter. Uh, if you have uh, many uh, bisulfite results, then it should work fine. Uh, if you have very large regions, again, that, that might be a problem. So just computation. I mean, it's all solvable, but it might be a problem. Um, I have to say, though, that the robust tests I did were for already. Okay, and, and, and then a question uh, by Mahendra Mahendasu. It seems to be very important to be able to sample correctly from the conditional distribution of Z given selection compared to non-selective inference, are the results uh, less, more, or equally robust to model misspecification and thus potential errors in the conditional distribution? Yeah, so of course they are more, right, they're, they're, uh, they're less robust to misspecification. And that's true in general for, 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 for all of this uh, selective inference. Even if you don't try to, to, to do a model, then you're, you're much, as I showed you before, if you only do the average of, of z-scores, then you're almost always going to be normal, even if the original data was not, and you get a nice normal distribution and you're pretty good, like maybe you do a T and you're, you're on very solid ground. Once you do conditioner, you have to talk about the tail distribution. It's always a bit of a problem. Uh, again, if you have a few samples and things like methylation where you're, you're uh, bound, bounded, then the effects are not that big. I mean, the main thing is that it will behave like a normal around where the threshold is. That's the main important. Uh, I mean, that it will be mostly normal around where the threshold is. And I think Jonathan Taylor with students has results about what happens as you departure from uh, normality. And they think that it's very robust uh, to, to departures from normality. Uh, I have not, uh, you know, I've sampled from non-normal data and it was fine, but you know, that's not a very good answer, right? Uh, so, you know, I, I've not seen grave mistakes, but it's, there could be. And, and the main thing is that if you have a problem with the covariance, this I did find, that the, the one thing my method was most uh, 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 sensitive to is departures from the, uh, is using estimated covariances. And the departure from the right covariance actually did affect the, the method quite a bit. Uh, and so actually uh, at estimating the covariance, I, I, in, in practice in the code, I use a regular regularization and you can do some pooling and, and stuff like that to make sure you don't get strange covariances uh, because it is, uh, yeah, it, it is uh, less robust to, to departures. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Yuval, again, uh, and thanks a lot for these interesting questions. Uh, so we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll move. Uh, we have to move to uh, to the talk of uh, uh, of Mitrana. Um, so can you stop sharing, Yuval? Yes.